in the end, you can always ask yourself, which emotion are you avoiding? If there's fear, it's the avoiding of an emotion that wants to come out. And your emotions are everything that you need to deal with any situations. If you have all emotions online, you can deal with anything because your body already knows how to deal with it. And this is something that really helped me that I can always bring it back to the, this emotional work and going away from these beliefs and these traumatic experiences and trying to connect the dots because this can be really overwhelming. Like, who told you that life comes without suffering? Like, what, why do you believe that? There, there, is no, there is no reason to believe that. When I think about this, it's, it's so clear. Like, yes, of course, everyone has phases days, months, sometimes some people even like years or like a half of a lifetime where they're just in suffering. But when I feel down one day, I'm like, fuck, something is wrong. Like something is... We can't even blame Disney for this because all the characters in Disney suffer. Like, can't even blame the romanticized movie world for this. Where did it come from? And there's also wisdom in that mythological storytelling because the hero's journey goes always goes through a big degree of suffering. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Spiritual Bypassers podcast with me, Yannick, Ashley, and Tim. And in today's episode, we dropped so much wisdom. It was a really interesting conversation about my MDMA solo journey and the freedom that comes from allowing disappointment. We talked about masculine boundaries and how important time management is versus allowing flow. We talked about how to get into a state of guilt-free rest, like real rest, where you allow yourself to go into extreme emotional states of like extreme sadness or extreme anger, and then come back to this like really peaceful, restful state and a lot more. And in the end, there is a very nice cliffhanger that has to do with Ashley's dating life. So you guys stay tuned and listen or watch to the end and have fun with this episode. What's up, Yannick? How are you doing? I am doing, wow. I am I'm very vulnerable and in deep processing and this sounds ironic because i have a protector part active because it's the start of the episode but uh, i i actually am i did an mdma solo journey um three days ago and that was really powerful and at the same time really confronting because what mdma does is it kind of sets your protectors to sleep if you want to frame it a bit more negatively. Um, or you could also say it makes you feel really safe artificially. And that safety creates uh, an access to traumatic experiences, memories, if you want to go there on this substance. And that's what I did. Um, so what you have to, if you do a solo session, there's a couple of things that you need to um, take care of and the, the, one of them is that you make sure that you really confront yourself with stuff because it's very easy to just bath in love and you know bliss and you don't want to like if you want to do it therapeutically you don't want to do that so um yeah i can i can share more about it um later in the episode but definitely that is there is kind of like an mdma hangover happening my serotonin levels are low and I feel very, yeah, vulnerable and soft and small things can create fear uh, and make me feel nervous and anxious. And so I'm, these days I'm taking care of myself, um, trying to have as much compassion for the little Yannick as I can, because another thing that happens and that's recommended on these MDMA sessions is to do a lot of parts work because it just goes so well with each other, the substance and the, the inner parts work. And yeah, so um, actually a lot of fears came up from that little Yannick, that five, six, seven-year-old Yannick, and he's very present these days, and he needs care and love and presence. And yeah, that's that's present for me right now. Other than that, I feel good. I feel um, I'm very excited for the next month. I'm going to be in Sicily in October and I booked my flights. I'm going to visit Ashley uh, and uh, another friend on Mallorca in November. And 
these are like really exciting plans. I'm looking forward to that as well. That's good stuff. And the things that we are working on also, the secret project. <laughs> Amazing. Yes. Well, I'm going to be less less sarcastic to you today then because Lil Yannick is present and he's sweeter. Mm, thank you. <laughs> I don't believe you, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm... Uh, also in a similar, similar, let's say, vulnerable-ish state. Um, a, a topic I wanted to talk about later is also in the healing world, a lot of us came to this because of going through our own, let's say, pains, whether it's physical symptoms or emotional topics. And something that came up for me a lot this last week was like, who am I to talk about this stuff if having a relapse of my symptoms? Like if you are in this work and yeah, telling people like this will heal you or this will help you and this and of course like it does to a certain extent and sometimes your body goes through cycles of like re repetitive yeah lessons that it's still learning and that's been like a really big topic so I've been resting this week I'm not getting up until like now <laughs> 11 12 in the morning um, and just really letting my body sleep even though the productive brain wants it to to do and do and do and there's all the stuff to do and productivity and all these projects and things that want to come through but then it's also the body saying to rest so yeah my energy is definitely more subdued than it has been the weeks before as well yeah i hear you and end of and summer before, hangover <laughs> summer hangover yeah yeah <laughs> and be, be, maybe before we ask tim about how he is i want to ask you another question ashley um because this is really interesting to me and this came up as a part of my integration of the MD mdma trip um when this is present like there's this one side of you that has a need for rest and another side that th like this productive brain right and wants to get things done do you find it easy to then really rest because i always call it the the guilt free rest is it a guilty resting or is it a guilt free resting and the guilty resting and i know this for myself doesn't really feel like resting it's like you rest and at the same time you you stay in this ner nervous state uh, nervous system state where you are still kind of like mm, i need to do this i need to do this and and then you're not really here and you're not really there. You know, you're in between the states. And one realization that I had on this journey was that you really need to go to the extremes. Like when you cry, like really go into the crying and really like when you rest, really go into the resting. When you're angry, really go into the anger. And the more control instances there are present and the more like the brain is still taking control and thinking and being like managing, the less wholesome this state is it is to go into that state so how how has that for you been in the, during these days um yeah if, if you understand what i mean um, i do it's a, almost the same with an emotional release when we say like can you allow the state it's like sometimes i'm in resistance <clears throat> resistance to rest mm. like i can't allow right now that my body wants to rest but the, the maybe the slight difference because it's with chronic fatigue it's not just like oh you, you didn't sleep enough the night before it's like a very debilitating rest. Like I even said to Tim this week, I feel disabled at times because it's not, it's like, there's no choice. Like mm -hmm. you have to go lay down. And even if the fire alarm went off, I wouldn't be able to get up. Mm -hmm. It's like such a like intense gravitational pull that's like pinning you down to the bed. And so it's like, it's, it is, yes, when that comes, I'm like, okay, I have to just like let go. And then I just like set my alarm for like two or three hours. And then I see how I feel then. Um, it's super trippy because of all the crazy dreams, even more so than normal. Um, so it's it's just been a bit hard. Like if it's just you're tired, then it's nice. Be like, oh yeah, I need a nap. That's nice. Like on a Sunday afternoon or something. But when it's this has been going on for like six years now, this like intense fatigue that I'm always managing. Obviously, like it's been way better the last two years. This is the first drop I've had for ages. Um, but when it drops, it it really all your old stuff comes up. It's very yeah 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 all your old stuff comes up and i still remember this really wholesome and beautiful moment between the two of us on the turkey retreat where i it felt to me like for the first time in years i was able to fully be nurtured and receive from the feminine from this feminine energy to become like really soft and really trusting in to this energy and really like oh let, let like let go like fully let go and just surrender into this nurturing 
Earth, Mother Earth um, energy. And I think that sometimes is what it what it really takes, like to get nurtured or to feel nurtured again, is to become so, 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 so soft and have so much trust that you just fully let go. And then you allow yourself to receive, like to take in and that nurtures you again, this like ability to receive. And this takes trust, right? And this takes like really surrendering. And that's fucking scary. And um, I, I can very much relate to that because when I feel fatigue or I feel like stressed and I have to control everything and I'm like, okay, the, I need more control that will create more safety in my life. And sometimes it's the opposite. It's just allowing to fully surrender and then feeling safe in that current state that's already there. So not creating more safety, but just using the safety that's already there to be nurtured uh, in the arms of a friend or of a partner. So like for, that's what happened to me the other day where I just, I felt like all these last weeks, I would, yeah, sometimes I was crying, but I wasn't really fully allowing it. You know, I was only like 80% and then 20% there was, control there and then i was just there like a little baby cries in the arms of a mother and it's like i have zero responsibility right now i don't need to be anything right now i just like hold on to that person and i'm just like this helpless little thing and i allow myself to be there. and somehow allowing yourself to fully step into this helpless powerless state is nurturing because you 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 somehow allow it to come on to the surface and to be fully seen and then you can step out of it again. And this is what I mean by with going into the extremes. Yeah. Mm. So I feel like I can very much relate to what you were saying. I do want to hear from Tim. I just want to add, because I one of our colleagues who Tim loves a lot, James, um, who's 76 now, mm -hmm. absolute legend. And he gave yes. me a call yesterday and he, he was also guiding me through some coming back to the moment and really being present, listening to the inside. But he was like, your brain and your organization and your productiveness is such a gift. And then he's like, and sometimes you just need to embrace how I live life, which is just like, I'm free. <laughs> and I don't care. <laughs> and I was like, I actually do need to take some of that on board. <laughs> <laughs> the laissez faire, like, I don't, I trust, I let go. I'll sit. If you want to sit and meditate all day, then do it in a way. It's like rebellious, nothing. <laughs> yes. I would also add to that that rest can have many faces rest can be laying in bed and lit in, in bed and literally doing nothing but what really balances me out is doing things without an agenda that are inherently fun for example playing ping pong i could play ping pong for ages and i feel really refreshed afterwards i can go into a ping pong session and feel fatigued and tired and then i go there and i enter a flow state and all of a sudden life is returning to me and not because i slept but because also from an inner child perspective this playfulness has gone into a cave and when i had my burnout tendencies when ash and i were in new york i could just feel the lack of fun in my life and how it completely drained my body. I wasn't like, I wasn't, I, I was only, I was only working, nothing else. There was no, there was no personality really left and no vitality. And I Even think just gymming. It must be gymmed, uh, right? Every morning. Like, yeah, but even, yeah, yeah, yeah. Even like, even you could say like going to the gym is nourishing and good for you. And that's all true. But even going to the gym has this, aspect of doing something in order for the body to stabilize and what i learned is and also what i'm currently working on is inviting activities things into my life that are inherently fulfilling without any product or any outcome attached to it and that's actually what what a child does all day long a child is not is not productive necessarily for the sake of being productive it's only in flow the, the whole time and when we're in this productive mindset, this inner child aspect gets shut away into a cave or into a basement, whatever. And this is also why I think the inner child doesn't necessarily have to be healed. It just has to be rescued from the place it's been trapped into. And when that happens, life force 
automatically returns. Like this is not a solution for chronic fatigue, obviously, but I found in my day-to-day, -day, you know, sluggishness, like, yeah, life is whatever. I'm like, where's the fascination? Like, where's the wonder? Where's the sparkle in a child's eye that just goes down the street and just sees beauty in everything? And I feel like this is, is a good antidote to find ways of introducing that. Also listening to touching music experiencing art movies poetry all things like that are really important for me currently yeah bring more of that fun into these podcasts more games yeah that that resonates so much and that's also related to what i shared with the rest like when i when i feel like i'm really rested and i'm in this state like of rest and digest yeah nervous system state after a yin yoga session or whatever everything becomes so trippy and beautiful like just writing a word in my journal becomes like a thing you know a beautiful thing and when you are like that relaxed i call it the relaxation high or whatever uh then these kind of things happen where you just walk around and you're you're wondering again and you see the sparkles in in life and sometimes i say you need the masculine energy to achieve things but you need the feminine energy to enjoy what you achieved yes receive life as if reality yeah. was a magnet and you're just pulling it in without any filters because that's for me what trauma and what resistance does it's like almost putting milk glass milk glass milk glass over your yeah. perception and it, things get dull and it's it's hard to take the moment and you can be as masculine try to break through the milk glass but it will it's it's futile it, it doesn't work yeah yeah you you will achieve new things but you won't feel better because you don't know how to enjoy them and it won't nurture you because you don't know how to allow them to nurture you. It's like you will have them, but they won't give you what you're craving for, which is the, the feeling of safety and nurturing that makes you enjoy life. Yeah. yeah and, and like, yeah, go on. Yeah. I want to share a big insight from my, um, from my trip. Uh, this has been coming to me after like two days of integration. There was chaos. There was so much pain. There was so much fear. And then w one morning it, it came to me, this statement. Now I'm making it really big, but for me, it was statement. really big. And and yes. it is, yeah, this, this, this thing, yeah, this one sentence came to me. And it, for me, it's so true. And it, it is when I allow disappointment, it makes me free. And I realized that all these things, like why I didn't feel free, why I'm afraid, why I don't feel good, all of that was just a fear of disappointing others and disappointing myself. Like at all costs, I want to avoid the feeling of disappointment, to being a disappointment to someone or to myself. And when I, when I allow, when I can be with the feeling of disappointing others and disappointing myself, then it makes me free because then I can really just do the things I want to do and really be with myself and be true to my needs because there's nothing really preventing me from it. Because I felt like in the end, it all came down to disappointment. I wanted to avoid disappointment. And yeah, that was really huge for me. Um, maybe disappointment is just something that resonates with me and other people call it differently. And it might be related to guilt or being wrong and trying yeah. to compensate that feeling of guilt or wrongness or unworthiness. But for me, the word disappointment really resonates. It's like, you cannot be a disappointment. And of course, if you want to see it from existential king perspective, a deep, deep, deep desire to be a disappointment. Like, uh, like one day, everyone will find out what a huge disappointment I am. Like I am really, and, and I need to prevent that. But at the same time, there's a part of me that sabotages it and is like, yeah, let's show them what a, what, what a di big, huge disappointment you are. Let's show them, let's show them. <laughs> I, I like the German word for disappointment, which is Enttäuschung, which means something like, what does Täuschung, what is Täuschung, you want Täuschung? Illusion, yeah, disillusion. Yeah, dis, dis, disillusionizing. Huh? Kind of like tricking? Yeah, yeah. Something like, yeah, d d disillusionizing, dis tricking. And that's really cool because it, there's a presupposition there, which is you've, you're either tricking yourself or you're tricking someone. 
and the disappointment is just it's almost like it's, it's shattering a mask oh fuck i thought i was the guy I, for example today i was late to this meeting and i disappointed you and i maybe i was disappointed myself because i had the perception of me that yeah i'm a guy that is like should or at least should be always on time and that's what i identify with and in being late this mask of myself or this um identification was just shattered and i was like fuck i'm not as good as i thought it would be and then and that's also what what i would be curious about um with you yannick then another feeling is really revealing itself like what is under the disappointment for me to me when i disappoint someone else i feel like they will leave me and i'm I'm responsible for that. And I feel guilty. I think I did something wrong and people will not love me. And that brings my body into tension. And I would be curious if you feel into it, um, into this general theme of disappointment. What's so bad about disappointing someone? What what does this part think is going to happen when you when you disappoint? Yeah. Yeah, I've been working with this feeling. It's a great question. Um, in sessions even. And the, the interesting thing is that I'm not even afraid of them leaving. Like when they leave, I can't disappoint them anymore. I, like what I'm really afraid of the horror scenario is I disappoint them and they stay. So it's a, it's a constant disappointment. It's a constant, I have no idea how unhappy they are with me but they still stay because they like some other parts of me. And I don't know that really deep inside they are so disappointed and they are suffering, but they are still like holding on, you know, they are still like, oh, I still believe in it. And that's the horror scenario. When they just leave me, I'm like, I'm okay. I'm like, yeah, okay. It will be hard, but at least, you know, I can be with myself, no problem. But when, when they stay in their disappointment, then it's this horrible thing of not knowing and, um, I realized also through my journey, my MDMA journey, that there was a lot of making fun of me. Like my parents used to make fun of me or in German, verarschen. It's like they they made fun of me. They they used it even as a way to connect with each other because their, um, their connection was kind of like, and they, they um, got divorced a few years later. So they used it as oh yeah, this is fun, like making fun of, of him, you know, it's a fun way. And then I, I, me as a child, I experienced that as, oh, I, it, it makes my parents connect when they make fun of me. And then I'm in this in between like, like, dilemma. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and what happens when someone makes fun of you or does this like, what, what's the English word for your, for verarschen? That's a good translation. Is it? Mocking. Teasing, mocking. Yeah. Like in a, in a really bad way. And in a way that, they have information about me that I don't have and I don't know everything and, mm -hmm. and they make fun of me in this kind of way. And so that's why there's bullying. this. Yeah, bullying is much better. Yeah. Bullying, it's bullying. Yeah, my, my parents used to bully me and other people in, in kindergarten and primary school used to bully me. And later I became the bully because it was too horrible for me to stay the one that's being bullied. And, and that created this like insight for me that was like, oh, that's why I'm always so afraid of not knowing. I need to know everything because first of all, I can't disappoint them or when, when I do, I know it and then it's not so horrible. The, the most horrible thing is disappointing them and not knowing that I am disappointing them. And I don't know how I describe that feeling because you, you asked, is it guilt? It's, it's a feeling of being wrong and not knowing about it. And then I realized a lot of men that I admire, they actually do that. They go for what they want and they are not super aware of all the things other people think about them or their partner thinks of them and they still go for it. And sometimes I hear from the woman, oh yeah, that this annoys me and that annoys me. And I'm like, oh yeah, he should, he should I'm judge, getting judgmental. I'm like, he should be aware that he's disappointing her in that way or treating her like badly in that way. But they, they don't really care. And then I'm like, I would care and I wouldn't do that. I'd be aware of that. And and well, actually it, it would help that, me so that much. Dynamic. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but I've been the feminine in that dynamic. So it's, yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, there's always a balance, but for me, definitely to balance it out for me would mean 
to be a little less aware and not, you know, why do I always need to know everything? It could also be okay sometimes to just disappoint someone or annoy someone. My partner also is allowed to annoy me sometimes and I'm like fully okay with that. I'm like, yeah, it happens sometimes. I'm okay with it. Not everything is perfect. And still there's 100% commitment, 100% clarity. I want to be with that person. But I can't trust others to feel the same, you know, but with others, I, I can't trust them that some things disappoint them and they still are okay and fully want to be with me. That's too dangerous for me, right? Interesting. I mean, you, it's also like no human is perfect. So no matter, uh, there would always be something. Yeah. So, like you, yeah. And you, I can't accept oh, that. I, I want to be perfect. Too much money like, or he's not humble enough or he's yeah. like, it could be either way. He's too famous or he's too poor. Like there will always be something that maybe people have preconceptions about it. Um, my my previous partner was just very rebellious. Like he's just like, I don't care if people are disappointed. Like I'm living, he's like super free spirited, like doesn't do anything the normal way. And he's like very rebellious about it and like doesn't care, at least on the outside. But he's a very dysfunctional human being. So yeah. And at the same time, it's very human as well to want after a while to want a little bit more of the other, like of the things that you don't have. And again, trusting other people that they see that as I do as well, and that they're okay with that and that they can deal with it and hold that and not immediately follow, you know, that impulse. I think that's also like the fear that's behind that. It's like, if something is not perfect, they will follow the impulse that they will want something else. And then I am, I get hurt and that my heart gets broken. And in the end, of course, it is the protection of my heart that like all parts, you know, they want to protect our heart. They, they want something good for us. That reminds me of, I, first of all, I, I found this, I find this conversation really helpful and really touching. And I want to share something. There is a reel of a little girl. She's probably two or three years old that is skiing and the parents have attached a microphone to her and they're recording her secretly and, and filming her and the real completely went viral and it's so sweet because that child is you know just skiing down this mountain and you can hear her self-talk because at this point she's just talking out loud instead of internalize an internalized voice and she is so sweetly positive about herself she's like oops that was close oh good job yay woo you can do it you know and I feel like there, what I just realized when I when I listened to you both, and I like I posed the question: What is this? What does this child have that I don't have? Okay. I feel like this, or or maybe us, us, we don't have, or many adults even unlearn is that feeling of primal trust that is reflected in a positive inner dialogue. This notion of no matter what happens, even if I disappoint someone, even if I'm laying in bed all day, even if I'm burnt out because I'm working so much, I'm okay the way I am. And it's all right. And to have a voice that is genuinely supportive in these moments, because I feel like for me, and that's 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 the reason why I find so inspiring what we talk about, I found out more and more about myself that my internal dialogue is really negative really insulting really unmotivating really like you know suspicious and seeing patterns and everything and it all points towards the single belief that i'm not okay the way i am and that's shame that's i'm fundamentally ashamed of the person that i am and yeah, I, I, I feel like, and I wonder what it takes to love myself in the way that little kid did. Like for me, I think the, it, like, like with everything, it starts with awareness and just noticing, oh, wait a second, I'm talking like this again. And then automatically you're like unblending from that voice and then just decide to say or or to to replace that voice maybe 
I like I, I don't have an answer for that because it's sort of it, it sounds a bit heady. It sounds a bit, you know, affirmations like this kinds of kind of thing. But I think it starts with just becoming aware and unblending. What, what would you say? What, what is the antidote to that? All three of us brought in something that's the antidote for that. So this is it's interesting. It's like as if you were sat in on my session yesterday with James, because I also was like, my inner voice is so mean. Yeah. She's so mean. Like I would never speak to people, my clients, my friends, in the way of like, oh, you need to rest. Well, you're you're gonna fail at everything and be on the street homeless. Like, why? I would never say that to anybody. And I, it's also hilarious because then I had a yogi tea next to me after the session, and it said, "Be kind to yourself." <laughs> I'm just like, fuck off. <laughs> um, That's but, so but, interesting. Now I need to get up and get my new shirt. Fuck off. Just someone <laughs> talking. This is my, this talking is my new shirt. No, <laughs> fruit of the loom rip off. For those of you who don't see, Yannick has a T-shirt that says "Be kind to you." What that I hell? have never worn. That's a new T-shirt that I just got from my uh, oh. washing machine. Out of my washing. Okay. We're clearly on the right yeah. path, guys. If those of you who don't know what synchronicities are, <laughs> that was two of them. <laughs> yep. But it just to add in, so the, what also James was bringing back, because I also haven't been meditating enough lately, because I've been like really avoiding all of the like routines that bring you back into yourself. And I mean, I do parts work, but that's just more sitting and reflecting. And when he was like, when that voice comes, eyes open, like focus on a point and listen for the stillness. In a way, it's kind of like healthy dissociating. Like the he said, it's the sound like when... If you're focused on a point with your eyes open and focus on it long enough and you start to listen for the, the sound of the cricket sound, it's like slight buzzy background sound that is when you hear that. And during my session, that's when everything was still. And when I got to that point of the stillness, that's when the like trippy acid effects come in where after like 10 seconds of doing that, I was already seeing like the walls moving and everything. And the yeah. moment a thought comes back in, it goes straight again. So it's this practice of like letting myself just be in the moment. So meditation does have its, have its tools. Like we obviously can work with the parts. We can express what needs to be expressed. But I think people also have this misunderstanding because we all work with emotions that that's the only thing we work with. And it's like, no, like you need to add it all. It's like allied health. Like you need your, your supplements and your body stuff and meditation and movement and emotional work and your spiritual work. So it's, yeah. And the inner child stuff that Yannick talked of, that is like so fundamental when there's like core things are coming up because indeed we're, we're saying this voice, which is like the naggy mean voice is saying this often to like a little kid and that little kid also needs to be held. And uh, yeah. Like really even just holding a pillow or if because if you don't have someone to hold you, then you have to hold yourself. And single girl over here, I don't have a partner to hold me at the moment. So I've got to do that work myself. And that's also inner sourcing, resourcing inside. Mm. So it's all yeah, it's all and and you have also you have other people that can hold you as well. And it it's it's also important to allow that. And sometimes it's we can think ten, in ten MVP. Yeah, <laughs> me as it well. Whenever, time. whenever you want to do, <laughs> whenever you want to be vulnerable in front of someone, currently only via Zoom, but soon. Yeah, that's the hard well. part. It's a bit, <laughs> it's a bit icky sometimes to like you want to be held. Yeah, as well. Yeah, but it's that's changed. True. I'm not going to stop moving around so much, so we will have bases. What I found interesting about your sharing is when you talked about dissociation, and you and you called it healthy dissociation, <laughs> and I would argue that it's actually the opposite of dissociation. It's being associated with the core of consciousness, the core of being, and everything else identifying with that nagging voice and believing it and having no, there's no line, there's no cut between that happening, no unblending happening from a parts perspective. I feel like being in that tr self um I don't know, self insulting, self demotivating trance the whole day is what is way more dissoci dissociative than being in total presence. And I feel like when, when it comes to meditation and also the open eyed meditation and non dual meditations, it's almost like it's giving me back my free will. Because if I'm buying into that trance all day long, 
I don't have a choice and an agency, but if I connect to pure presence, then it's almost like the thoughts and these voices are coming into presence and are not consumed by it. And I can just be like, oh, wait a second. That is me being present. And that is the voice coming in, which is also kind of me. But um, there is a separation between that. And I, I feel like this is disidentification is not dissociation, but more like being identified with um, yeah, the, the, the core of being. Yeah. Yeah. We've had this topic last time, I think. Uh, as well where we just how wild is it that we have like essentially a whole dining hall of this mind that we can't find anywhere like no one can find the mind no one can find the mind that's a good that's a good quote (laughs) that's a good quote for a t-shirt as well we should do merch (laughs) like all our (laughs) statements like the 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 main statements of our podcast we put them on (laughs) t-shirts for people to buy (laughs) that's actually a cool idea uh, what what I wanted to say is in this, like there's a 100 page um, kind of like protocol for MDMA solo sessions, one by, uh, what's it called? I think the Castalia Foundation. Yeah. And another from, from the MAPS Foundation. And they write about this topic uh, that they're, the core thought or the core idea of these like inner protectors in your psyche is to attack yourself before someone else can attack you. So for oh. example, uh, a little girl that is like being hit by her mother when she shows emotions, she will create a version of her mother in herself to protect yes. herself by already attacking her before the emotions even come to protect herself from outer you know, attack and outer hurt, outer pain. So it's it's an interesting explanation that I read for the first time is creating an inner version of the abuse that you are expecting from the outside already to kind of like already assume that before it happens and therefore feel safer with it. And then you can again come in with more compassion because you see, okay, what is this part actually doing? Is it really attacking me and fucking stupid and should go away? Or is it trying to already foresee what's going to happen anyways and therefore protecting you from more pain so it's again it's a part that is here for you not against you and even without abuses even just like for me a lot of the patterns i'm working with are just opinions that my family have about yeah. life money success business so it's also i guess like reinstalling like yeah that, that's the belief we have and you don't need to feel that any different before you even get to that we're just going to keep you fixed in that in that belief yeah. system yeah it's exhausting guys i'm kind of done with this healing stuff sometimes and trying to be it's better exhausting. personal development it's like <laughs> and you know the interesting part is I, I i can so much i can so relate to that and uh during the session during the session so many different things came up like fucking trauma fucking abuse and i was like did this happen or not fucking running into grown-up room of grown-ups having sex and being totally overwhelmed and believing that sex is something bad and painful and connecting fear with lust and passion and like and I'm like yeah and that's the reason for that and that's the reason for that and it's like so much and I got I was so overwhelmed and now integrating this I mean I'm still only on day three of integration so I, I I'm still like in the middle of it but still what helped me bring all of this together again, and that is uh, something amazing that 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 makes me feel like really positive about this whole like healing stuff. And when I get overwhelmed by too many stories, is that in the end it comes down to which emotion are you avoiding? Again, it's it's always you you know in the in the end you can always ask yourself which emotion are you avoiding? If there's fear. It's the avoiding of an emotion that wants to come out. And your emotions are everything that you need to deal with any situations. If you have all emotions online, you can deal with anything because your body already knows how to deal with something. Something sad happens, you feel sad until you have felt enough grief and sadness. Something like someone crosses your boundary, you feel really, really angry until you feel good again. And uh, the same with joy. You know, you actually something makes you feel joyful, but you are missing the joy because you can't allow the joy to be a resource for you to feel nurtured again. And uh, why are you avoiding it? Because you are afraid 
and you need to beat that fear first and underneath that emotion. And this is something that really helped me that I can always bring it back to the, this emotional work and going away from these beliefs and these traumatic experiences and trying to connect the dots because this can be really overwhelming. But if you always come back to, okay, I'm afraid, this, and this is not really an emotion, this is the holding back of an emotion. Which emotion am I holding back? Can I allow myself to feel the resistance against that emotion and afterwards the emotion itself? And this is really beautiful and simplifying and brings a lot of clarity and makes me feel so positive about the work that we do, which is I mean, because of what I just said is the foundation and is the core of the work that we do. And always reminding yourself, if you get lost in all these stories and childhood trauma, come back to which emotion are you not allowing to deal with the situation that you're in right now. Yeah. Um, so for me, really it was, for me, it was anger. <laughs> And it still is. I'm also like, suppressing anger at the moment as well. Because it's, yeah. I mean, a lot of the work I'm doing with anger is also when you're in this helplessness energy, this like, oh, that everything's happening to me and I have no control over this. And yeah, like just the the first thing James asked me in the call, he's like, are you depressed? And I was like, well, I'm always a little bit like, there's always <laughs> nothing there. Like, let's be honest. That's also how I like, I'm just a glass half empty kind of person. Um, but that's, it, doesn't really feel like there is purpose like I have so many things I'm interested in and I like enjoy doing but there's like this fire I feel like the the fire inside is like a tiny little match right now and it's used to being like a burning bush if you know what I mean so it's, it's like yeah and then you start to compare yeah. yeah exactly it's like comparison oh my gosh mm -hmm. also anger jealousy also anger um yeah so that was also I was like oh shit I have to start doing some of the medicine that I'm sharing with people and tap into my anger a little bit more these days yeah and <laughs> as we all know these layers right of anger sadness anger or sadness anger sadness it never ends it does, end. it does but it <laughs> Everything's cyclical. I think that's the thing I struggle with sometimes because it's been eight, eight, nearly eight years of having this burnout. That like, if, of course, I'm nowhere near I where I was when I first had it. Like, there's so many things have changed. So many, I have so many more tools and resources and connections, and life is just so different. So you always feel like when you come around one loop, you think it's going back to square one, but it's like going upwards, and that's like very hard to deal with because we just want to keep moving forward. And that's why a lot of my clients also like struggle with that when there's relapses coming. And it's like, there's just another layer of wisdom coming through and another layer of like this experience. And that isn't yeah. always meaning. Yeah, definitely. And the, the expectations, like yeah, the expectations <laughs> that are being created, right? Like it's the expectation of becoming a completely different person and then seeing that you are not becoming a completely different person. You you are still yourself. You still like all the things that you call a weakness is all at the same time is your strength, makes you the person who, who you are, makes you achieve the things that you achieve. And you don't want them away. You don't want all the weaknesses away. You just want ways to deal with these kind of like that, what you call weaknesses and uh, to empower yourself, to tap even more into the strength that your or trauma or your core wound creates for you. Your core wound makes you the person that you are. And so it comes with benefit and it becomes with challenges. And the better you become at facing those challenges, the better uh, you will be able to embody your strength. And you won't become a completely different person that all of a sudden doesn't have these challenges or these quote unquote weaknesses anymore. You'll just be the person that goes for the strength of your core wound and really knows really well how to deal with the weaknesses that come with who you are. And that's a big difference to thinking, oh yeah, all of this will be gone because this that's a recipe to unhappiness. If you think all of that will just be gone and I would be a completely different person. I'd be like that person. And you know, when you do that, you're like putting that person on a pedestal and not seeing all of the challenges that that person has that you also don't want. And then that's that's basically a comparison in a nutshell and why it makes you so unhappy and why Instagram is fucking bullshit, shit, unhappy maker. Also, this ever so slightly present belief that life should 
always be frictionless. Like who yeah. told you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who told you that having these downs? Like who told you that life comes without suffering? Like what? Why do you believe that? There, there is no, there is no reason to believe that. And like when we, when I, like when I think about this, it's, it's so clear. Like yes, of course, everyone has phases days months sometimes some people even like years or like a half of a lifetime where they're just in suffering but when i feel down one day i'm like fuck something is wrong like something is we can't even blame disney for this because all the characters in disney suffer like they use their bombs <laughs> or they're scrubbing the basements waiting for their prince like can't even blame the romanticized movie world for this where did it come from and there's also wisdom in that in, in that um, mythological storytelling because the hero's journey goes always goes through a big degree of suffering, and the bliss usually is present in the beginning in safety before the hero embarks on the journey and he's confronted with a problem, and in the end after he overcame like he slayed the dragon and brought home the gold and everyone is happy and. He gathered so much wisdom. But when he comes home with that wisdom, you know, you see all these. If, for example, if you see a very skilled guitar player or you see a very healthy looking, vibrant person, you don't think about the hours and hours of boring and painful practicing that this person has has gone through in order to play the guitar the way he or he or she is able to so we we only see like this glorified facade but nothing no one is living a per perfect life and, and and that's yeah and that's not so like healing it mostly is not so glorious it's it's there is no yes. like yes yes, yes. there is no you know, like epicness and epic, like the the violins are playing, and you're like, yeah, most most mostly healing is very quiet and very ugly, subtle, ugly, yeah. boring sometimes even. You know, sometimes yeah. it's really about doing more boring boring things for the sake of calming down. So, but everybody just applauds when you finally arrived at the finish line, but. You know, few people applaud you when you're like running up the hill and you're coughing and you're, you know, that's 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 not what people necessarily want to see. I might be wrong, but I, I think you get the idea. Yeah, totally. Here for more boringness. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's that that was good. There was so much in that. I feel like this episode is becoming something where that I take so much from and like there are so many things like going on and so many things that I can take with me and I, even taking notes sometimes but uh, just uh listening to the things that you I was say wondering what, you're, what you're doing so yeah uh, yeah let's let's yeah I, I was just like wow that makes so much sense I, I need to write this down <laughs> <I have laughs> like another why example. why believe that life should be frictionless or yeah. um this yeah this thing like having a need to make a decision but at the same time thinking that I need to make a decision. So it's like I sometimes on trips I get to this point where I'm like, I just don't want to make a decision right now. I have such a need to not make a decision. And at the same time, like you need to make the decision to to move forward. And then I get stuck in this pattern. And then I somehow enjoy being stuck. <laughs> then I'm just like stuck. Oh, I'm stuck. I'm stuck. I'm stuck. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. There's so much in there. So I want to say two more things on this. The first thing is nobody pats your back when you're resting. Nobody applauds you for resting. People only applaud you for, in the capitalist system, only applaud you for being productive. Like when you're resting and you're taking a time off, it, it, it's a very strange image to see like, good job. You took your rest. You had some fun today. You did nothing today. That's amazing. I'm so proud of you. Like there's some there's something off off with that because we're um we're conditioned to be gratified through working. Yeah, yeah. No. There's a this there's a total disbalance, and I can add on that onto that that when I look at the success I um, had on social media in the last month, the things that I got applauded for and the things that actually mattered in order to make this happen are completely different. It's like, 
I was doing a fucking weed ceremony facing my fear of rejection and my fear of expression. Um, and, and that was like one of the most meaningful things I did in order to achieve that. And people applaud me for, wow, you, you were so creative coming up with that reel. And I was like, that's, that was just easy. That was just a consequence, just like writing down a script, nothing there, recording it, and then having this moment of courage. All right. But like facing this fear before and doing this big ceremony and being there with the trees and like with nature and, you know, nobody sees that. And, uh, and the rest maybe that I had to take before and the fucking fear of, fuck, I'm, 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 I'm alone. I'm not going to make money. Other people will think I'm not funny and all of that. Nobody sees that. So it's, it's such a big disbalance between what people think causes success and what people applaud you for in, in um, comparison to what actually matters and what actually brings the success. And it's the things that nobody does. It's the counterintuitive things. It's the, sometimes the little things, you know, it's yeah. Big difference. And now we will take a toilet rest and come back after that. <laughs> so what I want to comment on that is because you, Yannick, said that for once you don't want to think about anything. You don't want to make decisions. And I feel that structure has, amongst other purposes, also that purpose to, to take away decision making because if my week is structured and i've made the decisions of how my day will look like yes just ease i can just <laughs> yes i can just uh ease into that and that's what i'm currently doing is i'm i'm living a pretty structured life and i feel so free because when i was traveling and basically like burned out and everything i was my mind was was cluttered with decisions now, and now i have the i come home like to the I come home to the same apartment every day. I was at sport. I do the same workload every day. I, I, I finish work on the same like on the same hour, and it's so relieving because I just don't I just don't have to decide anything. It's amazing, and that's beautiful. I feel like what this masculine, what masculinity does, it's making decisions and making things easier through structure. Yeah, beautiful. And that, that's really related to a question that I still had in mind, uh, which was about time management, because it is something that I'm currently like being in a new relationship and everything being like really excited, exciting. And, um, you know, there's there's more flow and there's less structure in my life right now. Cause, and I also want to allow some of that flow, right? I want to, you know, sometimes I want to stay up late and just enjoy the night or the evening and not put like a hard stop on it. And at the same time, I know how good it is to have this kind of structure and finding a balance there at the moment is, is challenging for me. And sometimes, like you said, it's the masculine energy. I feel like I'm failing in my masculine part of bringing in the structure and the containment of time, for example. So yeah, it's a challenge for me right now to balance the, I want to be spontaneous and in flow. And these moments when I allow it, they are so beautiful. You know, they like, they, they are really afterwards, they always feel like that was worth sleeping an, an hour less or um, whatever it was that I sacrificed for it. And at the same time, if you just keep doing that slowly, 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 it, it will like drain you. And, you know, you, maybe you rest, you don't rest enough or you don't get enough done for work and then the whole frame that you need in order to enjoy that just slowly slowly like crumbles that's like a fear there so yeah it's something that i struggle with right now so i was wondering how you guys deal with this kind of like time management versus spontaneity and and flow well i was reflecting earlier that this is the first time i've ever had only maybe one meeting on a day like this week my calendar is so empty. It's, and the occasional things, it's like little check-ins with like Tim, because we work together and other things that are like little tasks. But normally people look at my Google calendar, which is color coded and is like blocked full. And people mm. are like, what the hell? And that's just also how my brain has functioned for a very long time. And I'm way better than I used to be. Like when I had my burnout and with this like carefree ex-partner of mine, like we were such a clash. He was like, sometimes I don't open my calendar for days. And I'm like, uh, at that point I was like scheduling free time. I was like, <laughs> here's a block of free time and here's a block. And I mean, I still have to do that sometimes to block 
so people don't put calls in or things like this but um yeah just being very comfortable with having nothing on that the day agenda like that's very rare that I have that and my acupuncturist once was like try to have one day a week where you have nothing in the agenda in the calendar and I was like <laughs> impossible impossible <laughs> impossible like, <laughs> nope. how do you function as a business owner and how do you get shit done and how do you be a productive human and like because I always want to evolve and grow and be better and better and learn and learn and that's like this exhaustive energy that like does burn out even from age six my mom she had this phrase for me she was like Ashley likes to burn the candle at both ends and so even from a young from a young age that's been like present so it's very radical to like not have anything in my calendar it's scary mm. as well because then stuff could happen so I don't plan mm. what could happen it's scary <laughs> you know it's, to me it's um I I actually plan free time but to me having a calendar that is quite full is not a problem necessary because I either enjoy doing the things that I do or there's a deeper meaning and purpose behind the things that I do and they may be hard but I don't have a resistance to them being hard for me like it's it's pretty simple I'm I also have one day where I do, or two days where I do nothing, uh, Saturday, Sunday. Sunday is even a phone-free day, and I want to include Monday to it. And I just, for example, I I learned what works really well for me is to um, have certain days for certain tasks. For example, Monday and Tuesday, I work for my clients. Wednesday, I sort of am more focused on my studies. Thursday, I'm recording the podcast with you guys and I'm having coaching calls, things like that. And Friday, I'm doing maybe admin stuff and everything that has been, that is still open in the future. I'll record YouTube videos on Friday as well. And that way, I feel like I have a pretty good structure. And on Saturday and on, on the weekend and on some of the evenings during the week, I meet friends and I allow myself to have nothing on my candle, calendar and also have that part satisfied that wants to flow freely it's like yes you can have flow and at the same time i know there's another part saying i know that structure is important to me and you need structure in order to um, meet your goals and in order to be to have respect for yourself also so it's it's always a very delicate balance between that masculine let's just do it even though it doesn't feel good let's just do it Let's like let's not focus on feeling for for one for one moment, and if, and if the resistance is too big, let's sit down and check in with the part. But then yeah. also to give the part that is like no, but I want to flow freely. It's like yeah, okay, totally fine. Then let's find days, like let's find days or hours during the day or in the week where you can where this free flow is present and yeah. schedule. Them. And to me, this kind of Thing, this kind of way of living that I'm adopting now only works when I have a stable place to live. Because if I'm traveling, if I'm working in a cafe, if I'm going out for lunch, it <laughs> will break this cycle. And yeah. another thing is, I don't know about you, your guys' screen time, but at some point I was like, Tim, you cannot complain about not having enough time if you spend eight hours a day on your fucking phone. It's it's incredible. Should we check each other's screen time right now? <laughs> I'm gonna win because I've been in bed sick, but I still I, I can't because I use I'm using my phone as a webcam. Ah, how yeah. convenient! I think right now I might be at four hours. I want to get I want to get to three hours. Eight. Wow. Eight hours. <laughs> but it's up nine percent since last week. It's because I've been in bed, like not feeling well. But I've also put a block on my Instagram. So um, in from the morning, from 6 until 12, it's like got a block. So if I want to go on it, I have to go through two extra steps to open my Instagram. And like, So I really, if I need to go on it in that time, I just open on my laptop to reply to a message because sometimes there's work things on there, like clients. And then from 7 until 10 p.m., it's also blocked. And the last couple of days, I really noticed how nice that felt to not have the option of 
because it's really an addiction like going on instagram reels watching yannick just like scrolling yannick for hours <laughs> of course of course for me it's, it's different indeed, it's like you're going cold turkey on an addiction it's wild mm -hmm. to me it doesn't feel like cold turkey it, it more feel, you know the first there's like this impulse to grab the phone and then my phone is off and i'm like oh okay put the phone away but there's not this feeling of uh uh it's just like you know it's a very it's actually easy it's just about actually just breaking the habit at least for me and then to have something <laughs> something something else to do that is replacing that thing which for me is reading or meeting friends or actually resting instead of scrolling my phone and calling it resting so that's always the nicest parts about going to the retreats it's like you really for those days yeah. just no yeah yeah it's, it's so good yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, that helps me. And I realized while you guys were talking that, um, it's again, it's also related to the fear of disappointment, like disappointing, um, others, or for example, my partner, when I don't follow the flow and when I say no to things and it's like, uh, oh, this is a disappointment. He doesn't do what I want right now. And there again, it's such a big thing for me to allow myself to disappoint people because that makes me free i can only follow like the things that i want to do if i first of all as as you said respect myself enough tim you know to follow through with them and at the same time allow disappointment it, it has to be like that you if you follow your needs and who you are and what you want to do you will dis create disappointment and if you can't allow that then you, you won't be able to follow through um and Another argument that this like flowy part brings is like, yeah, but if it's planned flow, it's not real flow, you know? And and I, I, I get that. I, and I actually, there's a part of me, like I, me, myself, I agree to a certain degree to that. So it's, it's always, like, sometimes it's also important to just be easy on yourself and be like, yeah, I, I set a boundary there and I crossed it or like I didn't meet my time management expectations and that's fine. I'm not going to feel guilty for it. Next time I'll do it better. That as well. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for um, your perspectives on that. I have, uh, I have one last thing I want to bring in. Um, and I, it's interesting because years ago, my mom shared with me this fear. And then now I realize, and I, back then I was laughing about it, but now I realize how somehow through all the spiritual stuff that I've been consuming, I, um, I got myself into this kind of tr thinking trap as well. As le at least I believe that's kind of what it is. And it is, the fear of manifesting what you're afraid of. I don't know if you can, you guys can relate, but it's like, there's this part in me that knows, like from all the philosophers, like Jung, for example, yeah, the shadow runs the show and like what you're afraid of, you get because there's also a desire for the things that you're afraid of. So I'm like, it's get, gotten to a point where I'm like afraid of the things that I'm afraid of. It's like, shit, I'm afraid of that. So that means I will have that. Like I will manifest that. I will bring that into my life. How do you deal with the fear of manifesting what you're afraid of? If you have I it. Don't. Just I don't. Stop, stop, being, stop being afraid. Stop being afraid. <laughs> stop. Whenever I'm afraid, I'm Tim. Just, just, just stop doing that. I'm like, okay, just stop me. Um, no, I, I, I know what you talk about. I used to have that when I was a lot in like law of attraction, kind of uh, literature and and YouTube rabbit holes, but um, I don't, I don't have that as much anymore. Um, and also, may, maybe a way out of it would be if it manifests as something on the outside. If I get into a fight or something, I can ascribe meaning to that actively. And maybe I can make it mean that this is my segue into actually resolving that pattern. Like bring yeah. it on. If yeah. you just fly flying over your screen, I think, which is which is a nice synchronicity. It but bring it on and God is sending you a fly. Wow. Incredible. Yeah. This topic is a is very prevalent for me when it comes to the dynamic of dating because I always feel like the things that I don't want then come into my field and then the blame circle happens of yeah well you're doing this to yourself Ashley and it's your fault that this is happening again so uh, I'm still in that cycle like I don't have an answer for that mm -hmm. 
One one thing that, that I think like, yeah, we know. <laughs> Your whole episode about Ashley's failed dating antics would be I'm considering even writing a book. There's been that many of like Let's hilarious. Let's do it. Let's talk about your dating life. I'd be so interested. And I think maybe both both Tim and me can bring in our perspective. I could bring some uh, some topic. It could even be like which of these is like two three truths and a lie. Like which of these encounters is real and which was fake. And you're probably not gonna get the right ones. So. <laughs> yeah i love that let's do it um <laughs> and and one thing i want to add onto that is using existential kink um which by the way if you don't know it it's a book written by carolyn lovewell uh or Car yeah. carolyn elliott back then now yeah. her name is lovewell yeah that's epic she, that that's her name she, she changed her name to lovewell um and because she loves well she, she, yeah, she, she does. And she talks about how, you know, what we fear, we also desire and how we can get off, like allow ourselves to get off on the bad stuff, get off on the things we think are causing, is causing so much pain, like and finding the pleasure in that and resolving it, resolving the repetition compulsion through allowing ourselves to find that part that actually enjoys the pain or the, the being afraid of it. And that is something that works for me, at least in that case is, all right, I'm I'm afraid of disappointment, disappointing others. Let me be that disappointment. Let me really like let me disappoint someone or be a disappointment. And then really, how would that feel? How would that make me feel? Oh, so horrible! And it's so much pain in my chest. Oh, uh. and you're like, is there anything you enjoy about that? Oh, actually, yes, yes. It's so intense. It's so great. Like being in that energy again. Ah, oh, yeah, I can get off on that. And allowing yourself to do that then makes it much less scary and it doesn't work with all topics and the more intense the more challenging it will be but you can build it and you can do it with many things and it has worked really well for me so i try to apply that as well when it comes to this fear of being like okay let's go into it what's pleasurable about that giving me great ideas for next episodes yay <laughs> <laughs> well i would say with that we have a nice segue into the end of this episode we already teased what the next episode is kind of will be about. Check out, check out my forehead. Wow. It looks you like a, a little face, is on, like two eyes on it, Tim. It could be a little duck, duck face. <laughs> Look, I feel like a Star Wars character. Yeah. Maybe we get oh. Tim Botox for one episode. That'd be fun. Yeah, he also, wow. Whoa. Ashley, is... Ashley has the Botox in there already. <laughs> in my own, in my forehead and at the sides. Ashley isn't thinking. Just I'm, the I can't this one because this is my job. I need. The, I was like, I can't. This one can't get mm. frozen. Mm. All right. What's uh, the end of yeah, the episode? Uh, that's the end of the episode. We hope you enjoyed it. We need to get a title, Tim. Are we doing that in the episode? So no. Tim doesn't like ChatGPT for all the listeners. He's Tim wants too to change it there. this time. Let us I'm know. Not, let us know in the comments what you think about it, and if you enjoy the part about us finding a title via ChatGPT, and yeah. then um, we will do it according to your feedback. But this time, I suggest we don't do it in the episode. We do it afterwards because you know you guys know the title already from the beginning of the True. episode. We don't, so <laughs> we thought this would be really exciting. But in the end, it wasn't because you were like, "I already know it. I read it. I clicked on it." <laughs> the, the finding yeah. a title was always fun for us. Eighty percent silence and Yannick clicking. Nah, that's not true. 20% entertainment. It's just real life. It's not everything has to be perfect. All right, guys. You you know, these these people are too negative for me. I need to get out of like, this podcast. Comment. Like, comment, subscribe. subscribe. Share this episode Give with a friend. Up. Give us your feedback. Us us yes. three followers. Give us a rating on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, wherever you're listening to this. We love you. Thank you for supporting us and see you in the next episode that might be about Ashley's dating life. Sure. Quick <laughs> sight. What a cliffhanger. Bye guys. Bye.